morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. So welcome to Parallel Session 2B. I'm going to skip the bios, but they're all in the programme if you, if you want to read. Up first, we've got Alison from the National Oceanography Centre, and she's going to tell us about some uh, underwater sensors she's been working on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Uh, as, as mentioned, I'm Alison Schaub from the National Oceanography Centre, and I'm presenting this on behalf of Anna Lichtschlag, who is the, uh, the PI on one of the flexible funding projects, but she's at sea and couldn't make it today. So as you can probably guess from my institution, we're going to be going offshore uh, this morning. So we're looking at offshore uh, monitoring of offshore carbon storage facilities. So why offshore? Um, the whole idea is to store captured CO2 in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, which have been decommissioned. Um, these are great sites potentially, of course, as many of you already know, because they've been storing um, oil and gas for many, many years uh, prior to the point of us considering reusing them for another purpose. And they usually already have the infrastructure for uh, extracting resources instead of putting storage or putting CO2 down into the seafloor. So the majority of the storage capacity in Europe is offshore. So this is really um, a valuable resource for us to be looking at as a storage facility. And this has already been happening um, on a small scale, as small as in not so many different locations uh, in a few different countries, uh, including uh, some Sleipner, which is very famous amongst this community. Um, there's a project starting injection uh, in Denmark towards the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And of course, there's all of the, um, the new clusters which have been announced in the UK, some of which will be engaging with this type of work. Um, however, if you're going to store CO2 in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, you want to, to measure them, to monitor them, and to verify that all of the CO2 you've injected actually stays where you've put it. So of course, um, we hope that there's never any leaks, but we want to monitor them to be confident that that's the case. And this is important for regulatory purposes and for financial purposes, depending on the financial models. It's also really important just for, for scientific purposes, to understand processes, for ethical purposes, and to increase our confidence, the confidence of, of business and of government and the public that um, this process is working, that things that are stored are staying stored. So we want to be there in the unlikely event of any leak to make sure we know exactly what has come out, how much has come out, and to be able to understand it and fix it and avoid it in the future. So the technique that we're looking at uh, in, our, in our work, in our group, is through chemical signatures of releases of CO2. So um, if you have some very, very not to scale CO2 somewhere in the seafloor and it does manage to get out into the water column, those bubbles of CO2, if they're in gaseous form, will dissolve very, very quickly. So over the course of just a couple of meters off the seafloor. And when CO2 dissolves in water, um, seawater or fresh water, it uh, acidifies the water. So this is why we get ocean acidification with increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. And as a result, this decreases the pH of the water and it increases the dissolved inorganic carbon content of the water. So these are two signatures we can look at. And if we monitor um, the natural variability in both of these parameters and then see something that's differentiable from natural variability, we can, um, depending on the hydrodynamics and other studies of the area, point to it being either from a CO2 storage site or potentially not, depending on what else is there. So, oh dear. Well, the pictures overlapped my title, but it's not that important. Um, before I actually talk about the flexible funding project, I just wanted to mention a previous project, which is already finished, which sets the scene of why we tackled this problem the way we did with the flexible funding. So there was a project uh, with the acronym STEM CCS, which just finished a year or two ago, where we were validating various offshore CCS monitoring technologies by actually creating a controlled release of CO2 within the seafloor, and then putting lots of different monitoring tools all over the seabed yeah, in an attempt to see which ones worked and how well. So I'm not going to go through the whole picture, but basically we dropped a custom built CO2 container onto the seafloor, pushed a pipe down into the seabed, released CO2 at different levels of release rates, and used a number of different techniques, including the ones I'm talking about today, to see if we could, could spot the leak and quantify the amount of CO2 being released. So we put these chemical sensors on two different platforms, which give us a lot of information about how we would have to design a monitoring system in the future. Um, so as I mentioned, we're using chemical monitoring. So for this project, we actually developed some new custom sensors. They're called lab on chip sensors, meaning you take a lab measurement and miniaturize it down onto a small device. Um, it's hard to tell from the photo, but they're sort of the size of a head. <laughs> that helps at all those cylinders. And they pump in seawater, mix it together with chemical reagents. 
and do optical or in some cases conduct metric measurements of the chemical reaction results. And this lets us do really high quality, high precision, high accuracy chemical measurements in situ in the sea. So these um, are deep sea rated, so you can put them down to 7,000 meters in the sea if you are so inclined. They take about two watts of power, so they're pretty low power. And because they have calibration or reference materials on board, they're self-calibrating, so they can run for a long time. We've deployed them up to a year so far. And for this project, um, we used sensors for pH and for total alkalinity, which help us to get this direct uh, signature of CO2. And we also use sensors for nitrate and phosphate, which tell us about biological activity, which can affect the CO2 through natural processes. So that let us rule out changes that were due to natural or biotic processes. So I mentioned we put these on two different platforms. One was an ROV. Um, obviously, in the, in the long term, you don't want to have a ship and a remote operated vehicle at your site all the time. But for the purposes of this experiment, it was really helpful. We could use the ROV as a survey tool. So we could fly around in 3D uh, and map out this plume as it was being pushed downstream by the currents uh, in the area. So you can see a little diagram. And what I want to draw your attention to is... Um, this model here in the bottom right was created by taking all of the data that we got, just parameterizing a model with a bit of hydrodynamics in it. And you'll see that the plume is very, very low to the seafloor. And we couldn't detect it at this release rate in these environmental conditions above about two and a half meters high. So it's a big challenge if you're using autonomous underwater vehicles. A lot of people do not want to fly their AUVs within a meter of the seafloor because they are probably going to crash. So it means you need to find some technology that will work very close to the seafloor if you want to monitor in this type of an environment. The upside is that the plume was actually really long. Um, so this dissolved CO2 affected the pH um, through a very long sort of thin ribbon of um, CO2 enriched water that was being pushed downstream about 100 meters of detectability. So we've got a fair amount of spatial uh, downstream direction space to do detection, but we don't have a lot of vertical. And this was um, borne out with some more data from the same experiment where we put the sensors on landers, which are conveniently very close to the seafloor because they landed on it. And you can see even here uh, in this graph on the top right, this is a plot of the pH, uh, even between 17 centimeters above the seafloor and 87 centimeters above the seafloor. So seven, 70 centimeters of difference. There was a huge gradient in the amount of pH change we could see. And this is sort of oscillating because it was a tidal area. So every time the tides pushed the CO2 release towards our lander, we could see these big drops in pH. And then when the tides went the other way, we went back to the baseline. So this tells us we need to work very close to the seafloor. And ideally, if we want maximum sensitivity, so maximum ability to detect any kind of release or leak, we want to go you know, less than a meter off the seafloor. So this is fine if you've got landers, but if you've got a large area to monitor landers, you don't want to litter the whole seafloor with landers. That's obviously not a great solution. And that led us to, there we go, a potential solution, which is the project that's been funded under the flexible funding, uh, which are these flying nodes. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle being developed by the company Autonomous Robotics Limited. Uh, they're close to Bath, so in the UK. And they're designed to actually land on the seabed and hibernate in order to save power. So then they can basically go to sleep on the seafloor and come back to life and go off and trundle off and do some other activities. And they're designed to work in a sort of swarm fashion. So you put lots of them in, in the same area. And they don't mind us actually operating sensors on them while they're landed on the seafloor. So you thought this is perfect. If we wanted to monitor a large area, in theory, you could put sensors on these vehicles and pop around and study different areas over the course of a long time. They operate to nice deep depths, um, deeper than the North Sea, for example. And they can accommodate a wide range of sensor payloads, as you'll see. These are actually really small. So our sensors are awkwardly large compared to these vehicles, but they think they can tolerate it. So they've done some work uh, redesigning a custom chassis for the vehicles um, to see whether it would be actually possible to integrate our sensors into their vehicle. So you can see it's a sort of bulb on the top of the vehicle that's housing one of our chemical sensors. Um, and then it would also be getting power from the vehicle and providing communications to the vehicle. So operating through the vehicle's communication network to provide data back in real time. So through this project, they've been doing the design work and also doing some electrical compatibility testing, integration testing to check the communications and the power compatibility. The idea with having data back in real time means that if you've got a, a bit of a swarm mind, you can redesign and change your mission uh, in response to any signals that you pick up that you wanna investigate. 
Uh, further to that within this project, we've been doing some more modeling to expand on the models that we developed in that old project to cover a, a wider range of scenarios than just the one that we had in that one experimental setup in the North Sea. Um, so you get models like this, which are showing the, this is the concentration of dissolved in organic carbon uh, as a function of different release rates, different depths, different current speeds, that kind of thing. There's a lot of data, so I won't go into it all, but just to show you two examples that hopefully help to drive home the point of this. So this is a defined a sort of detectability zone. So this is how far away from the point of release can you actually detect a signal uh, defined by it being more than five micromoles of DIC above the background, which is what you can get if you've got a really precise sensor. And I've been sort of going back and forth between pH and DIC. Um, if you know enough about the local water chemistry, you can calculate between the two of them. So you can measure whichever one you have better technology for and calculate the other as needed. So here you can see an example just at, um, at one depth of the, the range, the size of this detectable zone, the sort of the length downstream of how far you could detect this release um, at half a meter above the seafloor and at three meters above the seafloor. So if you compare that blue line at top to the blue line above with different release rates, you can see the length of this range, the size that we can detect um, is a, about a hundred meters longer um, if we're just a meter and a half, two and a half meters closer to the seafloor. So there's really a lot of motivation here for us to, to pursue this method of using some kind of seafloor based or landing based AUVs, um, because it means we'll be able to detect much smaller releases or leaks should they happen. Uh, to do this, you do need to know a lot about your currents. So you need to measure the speed and direction of your currents. So you can't ignore that. And you do need high precision pH instruments. So I mean, hundreds of kilograms per day sounds like a lot of release if you're just sort of imagining normal day-to-day -day experiences, things that are 100 kilos or big. But just as an example of scales, um, I've put a note here. So Project Greensand, this Danish CCS project, is looking at storing eight megatons of CO2 per year. So um, we're, you know, as a, as a sort of relative factor, this is um, what is it, about 100, a thousandth of a percent, I think, of the injection rate is being modeled in that 100 kilogram per day release rate. So this is a really, really tiny fraction of the injection that we're trying to prove that we could detect were it to leak. So we're aiming, aiming high. Um, it's actually more stringent. Well, the regulations aren't quite set, but it's more stringent than what we would expect. The regulations will probably end up being for detectability, but we'd like to be as confident as we can that we can see anything that happens. So just to wrap this up, um, hibernating seafloor compatible nodes or other similar technology could be a really valuable tool for monitoring the water column during CCS operations. Of course, you'll still want to look at what's happening in the subsea floor, but um, from the point of view of, of potentially affecting the environment, you wanna also monitor the water column. Um, these models help us understand their limitations and we could then use them to plan operations in a particularly, uh, in a given environment, uh, if you decided where you're doing injection. And our pH sensor can be integrated onto these nodes. Um, I think in the long term, it's probably worth uh, confirming whether it's, these are the best option or whether you might want a mix of smaller pH sensors, which could potentially affect the nodes hydrodynamics a bit less, but they would be less accurate. So you might have to do a bit of trade-off between high accuracy and longevity or something. But uh, if you want really, really precise data, these are the best sensors you can get. So just some thank you. Um, the Ocean Technology and Engineering Group at the NOC developed uh, most of this technology. So that's the picture of the group up there. It's not just me. Uh, the STEM CCS project was EU funded and there's a picture of all of us on the ship doing this experiment. That's the, uh, the CO2 tank behind us. And of course, thank you to the UK CCS RC for funding this project and Anna who ran it, who, like I said, is at sea and can't be here today, but would be if she could. Thanks. So how this was all based in the North Sea? Yes. So is it translatable to around the globe? Or in, what, what were the differences? Yeah, um, so if you're in a much deeper environment, your CO2 dissolution will be a bit different. So things might dissolve a bit faster if you've got uh, different temperatures of water, different pressures. But even at much higher depths or shallower depths, I don't think you're going to get, you know, tens of meters of height of CO2 plumes, for example, it's still going to be fairly small, because it does dissolve really quickly in, in seawater all the time. From an operational point of view, I guess it's a little bit more inconvenient to work really deep, but all of the technology I've been showing works to 3000 meters. And I'm not sure if anyone's planning to do injection deeper than that. 
our sensors can go deeper, but the vehicle's not at the moment. And yeah. Is it site specific also? Is it better in locations? With like, I know the tides and everything. Yeah. Um, in the case of this project, the tides are really helpful because they let us see both the background and the signal from the release. So from an experimental point of view, it was quite handy. I think uh, from a monitoring point of view, it would maybe be a bit more convenient if there were no tides because it would just be one less thing to complicate your data to take into account. But um, it's just a bit of mathematics. So yeah, probably you're better off choosing the best possible site and not worrying about the tides and letting us deal with that than the other way around. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, thank you for your talk, Alison. Just another little question to follow on from Ben. Um, for the STEM CCUS um, release, approximately how much was was the water depth? I just been explaining uh, about the three thousand meters for the sensor, but what about the um, the test site that you saw and the and the degree of influence of the tides. I know that's a local thing, but of interest. You mean the degree of influence of the tides on the depth? Uh, so the water was 120 meters deep where we were, and the tidal influence was, I don't know, a, a meter or two, not a lot. Um, it was in the North Sea to the northeast of Aberdeen, about 150 kilometers, if that helps situate you. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't put a map up, but. How many of the autonomous uh, the AUVs would you need? And <laughs> has any work been done on opt on looking at the optimal behavior of them as a? Yeah, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. Um, until someone gives us a really specific site to try and model, it's a bit hard to answer, but. Um, Could you use the data from your model as a way of? Yeah, if you, if you were quite confident that any leak that was going to happen was going to happen from, for example, your wellhead, then you wouldn't need very many because you just monitor around that location. But it depends on bit where the regulations end up. If there's any risk of anywhere else being a weak point because of some fractures in the subsurface or something, you'd probably want to cover a bigger area. So if it was me just having to guess, I think I would dedicate a few instruments very close to the wellhead and then have a few just traveling around um, so that they're monitoring at a lower temporal frequency, but over a big area, um, in areas that are considered lower risk. Thanks, Alison. So up next, we've got Cranfield from Cranfield University. And he's going to talk about recovering some of the cold energy from CO2 liquefaction. So I'll be talking about uh, recovering liquefaction cost of captured uh, CO2. This is uh, our team uh, consisting of uh, Dr. Kumar, Sandeep, uh, UJ, and uh, Saisis. So the brief outline that I will follow is, first I'll give you a brief introduction followed by power generation using liquid CO2. And then I will talk about direct uh, coal utilization using uh, liquid CO2. So the CO2 shipping chain is uh, quite familiar to this audience. So uh, once the CO2 is captured, then uh, at the port site, there will be liquefaction and uh, followed by temporary storage and then loading into the ship. Uh, and the ship can take it directly to the CO2 storage or there could be uh, transport to a, another port, which, which has an offshore pipeline, uh, which can uh, uh, transport it to the storage site. So the Aims of our research has been to understand, optimize the shipping uh, shipping system, shipping uh, transport conditions, and to estimate the costs of the shipping, and to identify the opportunities and uh, barriers in uh, CO2 shipping. Now, if you if you look at the costs of uh, CO2 shipping, suppose say if I want to uh, not have any cost related to the liquefaction cost and I, I choose a pressure of say 65 bar, then uh, we, the required energy of uh, this very liquid, uh, required energy is less. But, um, we, and most of the uh, cost is coming from the compression energy, compression power. Uh, but the downside of it is that, uh, that the, we have to build a ship container which can withstand 65 bar. And also the density 
uh, is less at uh, 65 bar. So that means you have for, to transport the same condition, you have to uh, do uh, extra, extra uh, shipping trips. But suppose, let's say, if you go for a six point uh, uh, low, tempera low temperature, uh, uh, low pressure, low temperature transport, then we will have to liquefy to minus 51 bar and that increases the liquefaction, that liquefaction cost. So it is a balance, counterbalance between the liquefaction cost and the, uh, and the, ship, uh, and the ship cost. So uh, CO2000, uh, CO, he did an optimization of the full uh, shipping chain and he found that 15 bar condition might be a uh, 15 bar minus 28.5 condition uh, could be an optimal condition. So if you look into the costs of different uh, costs in the shipping chain itself, you, you can see in this uh, pie chart that the liquefaction uh, CAPEX, OPEX, and the liquefaction fuel cost almost contribute to 35% of the total uh, shipping chain cost. So what we have been thinking about is how is there a method to recover some of this uh, liquefaction energy and uh, uh, that uh, we have been uh, investing. So our idea is uh, before the liquid CO2 is injected into the, into the well, uh, into the well, can we uh, we can uh, we can use that cold energy from the liquid CO2 to run a heat engine uh, and then uh, go go for the uh, go for the sequestration and also if we can store some of the cold of the uh, of the uh, liquid CO2 maybe we can use it for different purposes so that that was the idea we have been working on. And uh, the specific goals of this uh, research has been to design the heat engine and also the cold and uh, design a cold thermal energy system which can store the CO2 cold energy and uh, to perform a uh, techno-economic analysis. So, uh, so suppose when we are trying to uh, to develop a uh, heat engine, there is a we know all uh, know the thermodynamic limitation of uh, of uh, with the Carnot. Uh, Thermo, thermo, cannot efficiency, and specifically now in, in this case, uh, we will be using seawater to uh, as the heat source. So, so we have twenty degrees uh, seawater, and we have a liquid CO two. So, the heat engine has to run between liquid CO two and twenty degrees centigrade. So, the efficiency is uh, quite low for this uh, range. So, for this typical uh, zero degrees centigrade, you can see the efficiency of the heat engine is only going to be about uh, six point eight percent. So also the storage conditions have uh, uh, have an impact on what we can do with the liquid with the liquid CO2. Uh, uh, this audience knows all these uh, projects, and you can see the uh, pressure, the reservoir pressure of uh, uh, of these different projects, and so uh, uh, different projects. And specifically for saline liquefiers, if we want to. Uh, 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 in store into saline aquifers, we need to pressurize the liquid CO2 to 200 bar. And in depleted oil wells, the, the pressure will be around uh, 20 bar. We have to condition the uh, CO2 for 20 bar condition. So also the uh, uh, temperature at the inlet of the reservoir has to be more than 15 because we don't want hydrates to form. Uh, hydrates to form. So, based upon all this, so the the design criteria for this uh, problem is uh, uh, is shown here, and uh, we so we, we investigated for different uh, pressure conditions like low pressure condition and medium pressure condition, and also we considered a, a pipeline uh, a pipeline length of uh, two. 2,000 meters to inject the uh, liquid CO2. And we also considered a maximum injection flow rate of 25 kg per second because uh, that, uh, is a, is a, that is a limit on the maximum we can inject because of the vibration of the offshore, offshore uh, pipeline. And also we, we were uh, doing the design for, uh, for offloading a 11,500 meter cube shape to be offloaded in uh, 24 conditions. So this uh, uh, we have used this to design our system. If you see the uh, 
process flow for the injection itself. So we have uh, the liquid CO2 on the ship, which will be pressurized using a pump. And then uh, it will be going to a seawater heat exchanger where it will be heated to uh, uh, 20 degrees, 15 degrees, so that we don't have hydrogen uh, hydrate formation at the bottom of the at the bottom of the well. Then, then it goes into the pipeline and then it goes into the uh, storage. So we uh, first simulated uh, the saline aquifers, the process flow for saline aquifers. So the typical numbers are, uh, you can see for the condition of six bar transport, you can see this uh, typical numbers. So one thing to observe here in this uh, numbers is that once you start to increase the pressure using the pump, the temperature is increased from minus 54.7 to minus 46.3. So some of the cold energy is is lost as as you start pumping the uh, as you start pumping the uh, liquid CO two, and then uh, uh, you can uh, see the different uh, uh, the effect of different process conditions on uh, on this uh, uh, different process conditions on on this operation. So specifically, I would uh, want you to note that. Uh, this pump work, the, the amount of pump work we require for uh, for specific uh, uh, for per ton of liquid CO2 if you are trying to inject. So uh, this is uh, about five kilowatt hour per ton of uh, CO2 liquid CO2, and the heat duty in this heat exchanger is about 11, 11 kilowatt hour per ton. So this amount of duty, if you are not doing anything, is going into directly we are rejecting into into the in, into the seawater. So similarly, for if you do the same thing for uh, depleted oil wells, uh, here, uh, even though the injection pressure is low at 20, we need to pressurize the liquid CO2 to uh, 60 bar so that we are pumping uh, liquid CO2 through, through the pipeline. And so, uh, so that, that sets the pump work and the heat duty. And... Uh, mm, for this case, the uh, the pump work is about one kilowatt hour per ton, and heat duty is uh, twenty two uh, kilowatt hour per ton. Now, say for example, now if we want to utilize the cold energy uh, and not dump uh, and use the, dump it into the sea water, so we can design an ORC system, an organic rank and system, which is uh, shown in the uh, upper part here, and uh, in this heat exchanger the, in the ORC condenser. Uh, we have the uh, we have the ORC refrigerant which is condensing in the ORC uh, ORC condenser using the cold energy of the liquid CO two using the cold energy of liquid CO two. So we investigated um, uh, R one one four as the refrigerant for uh, uh, for this ORC system. And uh, if if you see the results for uh, different uh, conditions. Uh, uh, this is the this uh, column shows the amount of work that you can generate out of the uh, ORC system. So uh, this is again in kilowatt hour per ton. So you can see that using the ORC, we can uh, generate uh, uh, in this case, in the case of 5.5 .5 bar condition, we can generate 20% 20 of the pump work that we require for uh, for pumping the liquid CO2, we can generate using the uh, du during the using the organic rank and cycle system. Uh, this is for the conditions of uh, saline aquifers, but if you see the same thing for the condition of uh, depleted oil well, you can see that uh, a maximum of ninety percent ninety percent of the pumping work we can uh, generate using the. Uh, using the uh, organ rank and cycle system. So these numbers are, uh, are uh, quite significant. Uh, uh, so it shows that significant amount of pump work can be generated using the, or doing the ORC system. Now in this column uh, uh, is what, what we have termed it as the ship equivalent. Ship equivalent is if I am offloading the full 11,500 meter cube ship in 24 hours, and if I use the same that 
total amount of liquid CO2 to, uh, to generate to run my ORC. So then uh, the maximum amount of power that we can uh, get is the uh, ship equivalent. So, so you can see that uh, we can, the ORC can uh, generate about uh, uh, 0 0.5, uh, 500 kilowatts, 600, 600 kilowatts of uh, 600 kilowatts of power. So that is a significant uh, potential uh, for this uh, uh, for this uh, system. So we we have also been uh, working on uh, direct utilization of liquid uh, CO2 coal energy because the ORC will require. Uh, additional uh, capital investment and, and all those things. So uh, the idea we have been working is, suppose if we uh, store the cold energy and uh, we, we saw that because of the pumping process, cold energy is available to us at uh, around zero degrees centigrade. Uh, what, what, is, what can we do with that cold energy uh, once you store it in a uh, thermal energy storage system? So one idea we have been working on is, say, once the ship offloads the liquid CO2 and uh, it's going back for reloading, the container gets starts to warm up. Container starts to warm up, and once it uh, once it reaches the loading point again, when you load the new CO2, uh, some of the initial uh, parcels of CO2 that goes into the container will warm up. So if we store this uh, cold energy, we we can use that cold energy to pre-cool the liquid CO2 containers, uh, liquid to, to some extent. So that, that has been the idea that we have been working. Uh, so for a typical ship uh, uh, of, uh, for, of, for the ship of 11,500 uh, meter cube of uh, liquid CO2, we will uh, require a cold energy of 23 kilowatt hours to cool the ship from room ambient condition to uh, to zero degrees centigrade, so that means for the whole uh, seven uh, for the whole seven containers of this uh, ship, we will require a total kilo uh, total of one hundred and sixty one kilowatt hours of cold energy. So that that is the amount of cold energy. If we could store that, we could pre cool the all the containers of the uh, liquid CO two ship. So we we sized uh, the because the liquid CO two is giving us only the cold energy at zero degrees centigrade. So we sized a uh, a cold energy storage system at uh, uh, which can which operates at, at zero degrees centigrade, and uh, we could we could use liquid water uh, and uh, so ice phase transition for uh, energy storage and uh, totally so about one thousand seven hundred seven thirty six kgs of uh, Water, if we store, we could store the cold energy required for uh, uh, cold energy required for cooling the pre-cooling the container. So it is a very cheap and very cost-effective uh, option. So once you store that, what what uh, the different mechanisms for the for charging and discharging is? Uh, this is the li liquid the CO2 uh, container, and then this is the uh, cold thermal energy storage system. This is the charging cycle where the uh, uh, cold thermal energy system will be charged. And once uh, this charging is done, this will this CO2 will go for sequestration here. And in the discharging cycle, you could just blow in uh, nitrogen gas, which will which will take the cold energy and it will cool the liquid CO2 container, uh, liquid CO2 container sheet. Okay, so we, so we did a preliminary design of the cold thermal energy storage system. So uh, this is a, a schematic diagram of uh, of this uh, cold thermal energy system. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, there is a potential. There is a potential to uh, use liquid CO two for for power generation, but it will it will require uh, capital cost investment. And direct utilization uh, of cold energy may be more practical because it uses a cheaper, cheaper, uh, cheaper option to uh, to utilize the cold energy. And uh, we uh, taking inspiration from this cold thermal energy concept, we we have uh, developed a 
cold thermal energy uh, uh, material testing facility so which is uh, show, shown in this uh, shown in this figure okay uh, that's from me uh, i would like to take some questions please um, hello i'm tamara topic from southampton university I would like to ask on one of the slides, you mentioned that you're looking at a ship design of 11,000 and a half a cube meters uh, yeah. for CO2. And um, I've noticed you used the seven tank for that size of the ship. So what was the base to decide on that size of the ship and number of tanks? Uh, there is one... Uh, uh, one in in the literature, the people have done certain de, uh, design of ships, so we have used that as the reference. And uh, this is eleven thousand five hundred is the maximum size, uh, uh, maximum size of the ship that has been uh, that has been considered in the literature for uh, transporting liquid CO two. So that uh, so that that is has been the basis for for choosing eleven thousand five hundred. I'll ask a question. So on a ship, you're limited by your space. It only has a limited physical space. How much more physical space is going to be used by having this kind of ORC system? Nowadays, uh, ORC systems come as a container, containerized uh, solutions. So it could be uh, like two, uh, two meters by two meters, it's a container, like a normal uh, transport container. So that sort of shape is, uh, is what, we, what this OR system will require. So our next speaker is Julia Rice from the University of Strathclyde. She's going to tell us a bit about the wider benefits that CC US clusters can have. Okay, uh, thank you, Ben. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've done um, at the Centre for Energy Policy at the University of Strathclyde on the role of CCUS in industry clusters in delivering value to the political economy. And the PI on this project was uh, Professor Karen Turner, and I'll be presenting uh, this work. Um, as many of you will know, and if you read my bio, I'm not an economist. Um, so I've been coming at this very much from an engineering uh, point of view. Um, so hopefully um, I'll be able to, to get across the nuances um, of what we've done. So in the Centre for Energy Policy, what, what we look at is undertaking economy-wide uh, simulation that focuses on understanding the wider um, economic uh, benefits of undertaking uh, policy decisions or technology decisions. And in this case, we've looked at introducing industrial carbon capture um, and then as part of this project, and then uh, looking at introducing a new transport and storage sector um, into the economy, which obviously doesn't um, uh, currently exist. So we focus on a policy facing um, analysis, which um, which may be required to deliver the outcomes of the modeling that we do. So this project was undertaken in uh, 2020. We finished uh, the project. Um, so I'm gonna sort of maybe start by um, uh, giving you some uh, indication of why we started this. Um, so this slide is the bumps on the road that we've been talking about um, during uh, this conference. And I guess my reason for getting involved in this is that I was involved in at least two of those bumps on the road. So I worked on the Longanit um, project and I also worked on, on White Rose. And I guess at the end of uh, 2015, uh, we were... Um, this very conference in, in 2015, we were kind of wondering what we were going to be, be doing next. And that kind of stimulated um, some thought pieces that we did um, at Strathclyde around why um, the, the final competition um, had been cancelled and a number of uh, posters there and uh, a thought piece that we did for the Carbon Capture Journal. Um, and I guess the, the question we were asking was when it was analysed, um, you won't be able to see, but in that little box at the top there, it says... Um, her, Her Majesty's Treasury raised concerns about the merits of the carbon capture and storage competition given fiscal constraints. And so what we wanted to understand was 
what were those fiscal constraints and how could Treasury have got to a point where they made um, probably a, a, a different decision? Um, so we started looking at uh, narratives um, around uh, carbon capture uh, and storage. And um, I guess one of the things that, that, um, that came out of that is um, what is the value of CCS um, in enabling sustained contributions of sectors um, where we currently realize value that we currently re realize value from and 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 how can we continue to realize value from those in, in the future and that um, was uh, picked up and uh, directly quoted um, in the CCUS um, action plan so that is where we started the research and that is uh, what we were we were interested um, in looking at and so when we started this uh, project, we really had two questions and we focused on uh, the Scottish um, sector, um, uh, Scottish cluster ar around Grangemouth. So what we wanted to understand was what is the level and nature of the economic value via high value added job that's it's currently um, in the Scottish sector um, and how does that, uh, what's the interdependency of that value across different activities? And then the next question was um, how and to what extent uh, may the sustainability and further growth of, of this activity um, add value um, to um, the deployment of CCS or um, at this site? How is that going to um, add value? So that they were the two uh, research questions uh, that we started with um, in this project. Um, and as I said, we um, centered around the Grange Mouth Cluster. And if you've been looking at um, some of the, the slides that we saw yesterday, you realize that the majority of the Scottish chemical industry is uh, located at uh, Grange Mouth. And that Scottish chemical industry currently directly employs 5,691 full-time um, equivalent workers or did at 2015, which was the, the last date that we had. So the first thing we wanted to do was to understand what other jobs are generated because of um, that, that industry um, at Grangemouth. And our analysis showed that a further 7,796 full-time equivalent workers are employed in supply chains throughout Scotland. Um, and this is referred to as multiplier um, analysis. And, and it uses input-output tables, which are, are published by the, the Scottish government. And this type of analysis is used by policymakers when they are considering how much activity is ultimately um, supported by different industries across uh, the wider eco economy. So from this um, question, we asked another question, um, is to what extent can that employment be considered to be high, high um, quality employment. So to answer this question in this project, we developed a new metric that we have termed the wage premium or the average wage supported by um, an industry's activity. And um, this is our wage premium uh, multiplier. So along the bottom there, you can see um, the different sectors are within the economy. And I've uh, underlined in red the one that we're considering here, which is uh, petroleum refining and uh, petrochemicals. And you can also see the average um, Scottish wage there. So it plots out this uh, new wage premium, which is uh, the green line or um, the uh, yellow line if we don't take into account um, the, 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 the sector that we're considering. And if we focus on the petroleum refining and petrochemicals, uh, much of which is uh, focused in um, the INEOS operation at, at Grangemouth, you can see that, um, uh, and this was done using um, the Scottish input output tables from 2015, and this tells us that that industry um, directly employs to just over two and a half thousand people, but supports another 1,800 um, uh, full-time employers within the Scottish um, supply chain. 
And our new multiplier metric tells us that the average supported wage across the indirect supply chain component is 38,206. So that industry is supporting a or delivering a wage premium of almost £6,000 per worker above um, the Scottish average FTE. And this is one of the largest wage premiums delivered by any uh, Scottish industry. Therefore, in considering how um, industrial actions or industrial decarbonisation actions may impact the value delivered by key industries such as Scottish chemicals, it's important to consider the circumstances, including decarbonisation activity in the other Scottish sectors that it currently shares that strong domestic supply chain with. So, So... What I'm saying is um, it is critically important to take a whole economy view of decarbonisation. So now that we had established the value of that industrial sector and the value of the industrial sector that we're um, going to be decarbonising, the next research question um, sort of asks, well, how will this um, value be impacted under different scenarios of introducing CCS um, and critically and crucially paying for CCUS. So that brings us uh, to the next part of um, our project, which was modelling the introduction of CCS into the economy. So at the minute, minute, CCS isn't a sector in in the economy. So when we're using our uh, models, we have to to input it somehow um, into um, the the economy. And there are different ways um, of doing this. Often it's just seen as an upfront uh, capital um, investment, um, but that um, is not an entirely accurate way to do it because you also need to um, consider ongoing operational implications. Um, the other thing uh, we need to do is to understand how we will also put a transport and storage sector into the economy, again, which doesn't uh, currently exist. So we decided to do this in two parts. And the first part was part of the UK CCSRC project. And the second part I'll touch on because it kind of answers another question, um, uh, which is was, was, was follow on uh, funding um, from this project. So we did this in a two-step process using um, a CGE, a comp- comp- computable general equilibrium uh, model. And that model, as you can see, I can't even say the word, let alone um, uh, understand the economics behind it. But as I understand, it takes a a general uh, view of the um, economy to create this general um, equilibrium. So we did this in two stages. The first was to introduce um, capture into the process and then to consider transport and storage. And we considered capture as an additional capital requirement. And initially we set this up as a worst case scenario where the capture causes a 50% reduction in capital efficiency for um, these industries. Um, Now the cost to capture may be lower. And so we are taking a worst case scenario there, but we kind of balanced that with a more optimistic Um, setting where critically the firms and the workers did not choose to leave Scotland um, as pressure on competitiveness and employment uh, rose. So that was a more balanced um, approach. So if we focus on the carbon capture part, the critical question is who's going to pay for this? And when we go out and talk um, to uh, people, um, that is one of the main questions that they ask. And so we considered three scenarios here. One is that polluter pays. Um, The second was that there was um, a public funding um, option which reallocated existing government expenditure. And the second was that um, that public funding option socialised the costs um, through uh, direct income income tax subsidy. So it was like the households paid um, for this. I'm going to, um, in this talk, just uh, give you the results um, for the polluter pays and the public funding um, option too. Um, so um, the high level results um, 
do operational capture costs impact competitiveness of the Scottish industry? So in all of this, the, the um, scenarios we looked at, um, it, whether polluter pays or public, public funding, there was a contraction in uh, Scottish uh, GDP. So, um, and what that, um, uh, so in, in order to um, mitigate the results of um, th this increase in capital efficiency, um, the resulting um, contraction in export demand could trigger um, what ultimately becomes a lasting contraction um, in GDP, Scottish GDP of between 175 and 200 million uh, per year. And this would be associated with a sustained negative impact on um, the public budget of about 41 million pounds per annum. There would also be a 10% reduction um, in chemical jobs, um, in chemical industry jobs in Scotland and a further 750 additional jobs lost through the Scottish economy as we've um, talked about the impact there. Um, the second um, uh, result there, the public funding option two, um, also shows that the economy is still likely to contract but here the nature of the contraction is different with a smaller sustained GDP loss of between 125 and 130 um, million pounds per annum over the longer term. However, the total jobs loss would be greater with up to two and a half thousand jobs at risk. However, the jobs that would be lost here are not the high value added, high uh, wage chemical jobs. These, those jobs would be limited. It would be um, concentrations of job, uh, lot, job losses in sectors depending either directly or indirectly on household spending. So the critical outcome emerging from this CGE analysis is that the economy is likely to contract regardless of who pays. Um, uh, with the question being the extent and the distribution of those losses. So whether economy is likely to respond to price and income effects in the types of ways that we've sent, sent, sort of simulated here, the key policy implication emerging is the need to identify and enable solutions that allow the challenging but likely essential, um, not likely, um, essential implementation of industrial carbon capture in a manner that distributes costs um, in a way that is acceptable um, to society. Um, there is also, um, so I guess that uh, the next challenge for um, CCS in this regard is whether when we deploy CCS, is there some in the full chain, is there um, a mechanism by which we could potentially generate GDP, income and revenue to justify um, policy action to protect the competitiveness of these uh, capturing um, firms, in addition to a range of other likely demands on public source resources in supporting uh, infrastructure and regulatory requirements. Now, such questions are uh, particularly strategically important um, in, in Scotland, where um, the existing oil and uh, offshore uh, oil and gas and uh, industry and supply chain would be crucial in enabling CO2 transport um, and storage. So um, I guess going back to our research uh, questions, what we found is that um, the, the substantial um, there is substantial economic value in the industries that will be required to capture uh, carbon, but this will be put at risk where the operating capture, i.e. additional requirement to produce the same output, impacts the international competitiveness um, of these firms. So I wanted to now to move on to um, how we um, look at the transport and storage part. So um, this was funding that came out of the... Um, of, of this uh, UK CCSRC work. Um, so is, if we develop a new industry um, and develop new industry activity to support CO2, can this transport and storage um, uh, uh, industry or sector um, deliver uh, these net gains? 
So what we've done is we've taken our CGE model, and this is the model that Treasury uses. So it's it's a model that Treasury understands. And we've um, tried to introduce um, a transport and, and storage sector into that industry. And we've used as that a proxy um, the oil and gas um, industry. And obviously, this wasn't part of this, this project, but um, to give you some uh, uh, teasers, um, if you like. So what we have found um, by doing this, introducing this sector, is that the deployment of CCS could be a source of green growth where the, this new sector exploits the capacity, the workforce and the supply chains currently associated uh, with the um, UK oil and gas um, sector. And um, in particular, um, some key um, insights from this um, is that there, there could be green growth opportunities, um, most obviously um, in the transition from um, oil and gas um, and in, in developing this new CO2 transport and storage um, services and the jobs that would that would bring and we've um, uh, that was talked about uh, yesterday. What we've shown is that whilst um, gross cost could persists, as we saw with capture, there are net gains in GDP, employment and other macroeconomic variables that are also possible with the supply chain activity associated with transport and storage. But again, the key question here is who pays um, for that? And I've put um, a question in uh, green there, which is something that we've been talking about. Um, so it's not a question I'm going to answer, but just a question I'm going to pose is that is green growth a necessary contribution from CCS? Um, and is, is it justified by the emissions reductions um, in themselves? Um, so that is one um, insight that we've got from our uh, transport and storage work. And the other is um, around meeting just transition um, ambitions and how we transi transition people um, or repurpose existing supply chain capacity, existing infrastructure, um, and transitioning people from those oil and gas supply chains into um, a decarbonisation or carbon management um, industry. But critically, as I've said, who pays is um, critically important. Um, however, just, just to be clear, there are direct gross gains. We can see in our modeling sustained across all the scenarios of who pays, um, but the impacts um, are different over time, crucially depending on who pays, whether it's the government, whether it's industry, whether it's households, um, uh, and that the, the results are dependent not only on who pays, but also on when that uh, funding becomes available and when the, the level of when when and how that level of investment is deployed so um I hope I've given you an over overview of what we've been doing um, in this uh, project, which has allowed us um, to start um, using uh, this modeling um, in terms of the impact that the project had, um, we have um, some uh, policy briefs and working documents that um, you can go and download and, and, and some papers which um, describe our wage premium multiplier analysis and also um, the analysis of putting um, capture um, into the economy as a, a, a capital cost. Um, the, from this work, we've been able to... Uh, prevent, uh, give evidence at um, the uh, House of Lords um, in the state aid and level playing field inquiry. And we're also um, interacting with Bayes in seeing how um, they can um, develop business models that um, we, we, look, uh, we heard about uh, yesterday and what the impact of those different policies and timing um, and mechanisms of uh, investment might be. And as I've said, um, because of the work that we did um, for UK CCSRC, we have had follow-on funding from uh, Bologna and the Children's Investment Fund, which um, fund foundation, which enabled us to go and do on and do the, the transport and storage work. And we're also involved in the um, SNZR and SNZI um, roadmap project and phase two infrastructure proposal. 
So um, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take uh, a- a- any questions. And, and if I can't answer them, we'll certainly try and, and find out um, answers for you. So thank you. Thanks, Julia. That, that was great, despite your downplay in your... Uh... <laughs> um, but I guess my question is about the the losses of, you know, essentially either the polluter pay or the public approach to... Um, you know, the impact this would have on the chemicals industry. I mean, I, I assume this is, maybe it's the Brexit <laughs> worldview, but the, the, the UK move, um, kind of moves ahead alone, right? Because this isn't, you know, Chinese company. I assume like may, many of the competitors for the chemicals industry would be actually European. And in that case, that might be, you might be showing a fairly, pessimistic view because if, if we would if we would do it we wouldn't do it alone we would probably do it with european or other allies right? absolutely and i think that was one of the um early sort of uh fight um questions that that was raised. yes we assume that um prices in the uk or the scottish chemicals rises but they don't anywhere else because nobody else is doing it um so yes if you then took that into account as well it would be more optimistic in the sort of capture capture phase but yeah that that this part of the analysis didn't assume that it it did assume that um we we did it and nobody else did Mm -hmm. and then you would but then you could um play tunes on the capital efficiency to do that so i guess we've shown the worst case yeah yeah but absolutely yes yeah um hello thank you for the presentation so do you believe that CO2 is ever going to be competitive in price, um, regardless the the model of how it is going to be funded, whether polluter pays or uh, consumers? Uh, but is CO2 going to be competitive for transportation companies to to manage it and to be profitable to transport CO2? Oh, so I guess it, it is your question, um, how does that funding disappear over time as it becomes competitive? Is that, uh, is that your question? Is it, so is it around, do we take into account CO2 price in this analysis? Is, is no, but we are. Now, that's, that's the ne- next stage, is taking into account this, uh, the price of CO2, because then... Um, Yes, there becomes some value with it within that. So at at the minute, um, uh, it it isn't included. But the um, projects, one of the projects that we've been doing with, um, uh, consequently, is taking into account carbon price and um, looking at playing tunes on, on that as well. So yes. Hi, this is uh, Mohammed Naimullah from Health and Safety Executive. So. Uh, I guess I have two questions. One is, uh, how sensitive is this analysis? I think you've touched on, you're looking at carbon pricing and how it affects. Mm -hmm. What is this carbon price you've considered in your polluter based analysis at the moment and how how it can change in the future? Um, So at the minute, no, um, it's not. I guess it's um, in order to combat the um, extra capital um, the loss in capital efficiency, the prices go up. That's how it, um, so the price of the product goes up. So if you're selling, and which relates to David's question is that we don't assume that that happens in any other, in any other economy. Um, so um, we don't take that into account um, in terms of um in, in that polluter pays analysis, but in in the um, sort of uh, government deficit um, and the um, um, the income tax um, um, mo- models, uh, uh, again, I, I'm not entirely sure of how that 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 works in, but um, uh, it, carbon pricing wasn't something that was considered in in these this round of the analysis. I guess the second question is, in terms of being the world leader for net zero mm-hmm. and moving there first of all, et cetera, does that mean that there is less motivation from an economic perspective to be the first mover in the CCS arena? Going back to David's question as well, 
if we do it and nobody else is doing it. So we take the position early, but we don't get uh, much benefits. In fact, possibly we lose. Is that what you're thinking is? Um, so I think, um, and I, I think this was mentioned in the the um, the talk from uh, the gentleman from Bayes yesterday talked about um, the UK having first mover advantage. I think talked about having first mover advantage since 2005. So um, uh, I think uh, there is, um, I guess, in, in this analysis, no, we're, we're, we're assuming that this carbon management industry is uh, um, it is enclosed. Um, so we're not, neither are we considering exports. And that's the next thing that we're, we're looking at as well. Um, so there are, or... Um, for example, looking at um, how clusters are going to develop. And for example, thinking about the, the Grangemouth cluster, um, imports of carbon into the Grangemouth cluster for um, then um, transporting and storing, that's not taken into account either. I think that, again, that is the next uh, stage of our, our modeling, something we're, we're, we're looking at. I, um, in terms of how can um, an import export then uh, give you a, a market um, for CO2? So I guess um, what the UK CCSRC uh, money allowed us to do was to start this analysis. But as we've seen, it raises a lot of questions, uh, and and then we've been gradually in, in putting these parts into our um, our analysis. So trading between clusters is a, another. Um, uh, thing that could be included. Um, the, the the main, um, uh, I think this was mentioned in a, a talk uh, yesterday, is that we've used input output tables uh, and, and analysis for the Scottish economy because they are they are give they are provided, but they're not those type that type of economic data is not available for uh, the Solent um, or Teesside, Humberside, it's not available. So you have to do proxies um, for that. So you can either do Scot Scotland or the whole e economy. Um, so the great, that's what we call Grangemouth becomes a nice cluster to study. I think we should move on. Okay. Thank you. I realise that I'm between you and uh, coffee, so I'll try and uh, not take too long to go through this. So this is acknowledging the flexible funding that we got from UK CCSRC uh, quite a while ago now. And uh, this is looking at the geochemical baseline for CO2 monitoring at the Carbon Management Canada Field Research Station. And as we sort of heard from the first talk actually this morning, uh, understanding baseline parameters and understanding part of that is, is quite important when it comes to geochemical monitoring. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been learning uh, from that on the way through. And I should say that this is not uh, my work, it's mostly Rachel Utley's work uh, when she was doing her PhD with us. And then that's been continued by Emma Martin Roberts, who's a postdoc working on, on this uh, specific project. So as we all know, in terms of uh, regular deployment of CCS technology, we want to know uh, things around the monitoring side of things. So obviously here on the right, we've got the deep, uh, in this case, offshore CO2 storage site. Uh, and we obviously are concerned and people are obviously concerned about migration out of such storage sites. Uh, so part of the geochemical work that I've been doing for, for quite a while now is looking at how we can use that to understand uh, potential migration pathways, uh, how to determine the fate of the injected CO2 in terms of what happens to it in the su uh, subsurface, both of a short and longer term timescales, and also knowledge of the conditions that we have as the baseline prior to injection and how those can change post-injection so that we can use that to see and monitor for any change. And the other part that I have been working on more recently is what we can use in the CO2 itself that's injected. So the idea of using the inherent traces within the CO2, avoiding the need for, for adding expensive artificial traces. And basically all of this comes down to developing and testing methods to verify secure CO2 storage. So what we've been doing at the FRS site, so just a bit of a brief introduction as to where it is. So this is in Alberta, near the town of Brooks, which is sort of to the east of Calgary. And it consists of a series of 
well, one injection well and a series of observation wells and also a groundwater uh, well. This is what it looks like from above. So you can see it's like, I don't know whether you're familiar with test sites, but it looks like quite a few other test sites that I've been fortunate enough to, to work on around the world. So we've got our couple of observation wells. One uh, is equipped with geophysics observation tools. The other is for taking uh, geochemical samples. We've got the injection well with the CO2 tank, which is a big silver thing in the middle of the foal. Um, and they've got their geophone arrays uh, associated apparatus with the CO2 injection. And obviously they're injecting CO2 and the idea is to monitor that and see where it's getting to and what's happening to it. In terms of the complex where they're injecting it into, it's a river, so the Basal Valley River sandstone uh, in terms of quartz and then with a sealant and that's a sealant, the foremost uh, formation, uh, which is, and the whole horizon is stacked. Another thing to point out is stacked with alternating coal layers uh, in and all of this uh, is an interesting site to look at in terms of understanding the gas chemistry, because particularly around the coal layers and methane uh, and resolving methane from CO2 is one of the other ideas that we wanted to, to work on. So looking at where we have taken samples, so just to, to reset, right in the middle is the injection well and the injection zone there at about 300 metres, that's where they're injecting the CO2. And as I say, we've got these geochemical and geophysical monitoring wells. They've also got a shallow, uh, shallower level West Bay uh, multi-level groundwater well, which is uh, through uh, the, the top 100 metres. And then actually something else that they put in just to see for monitoring purposes, a, a just standard domestic uh, water well. So a well that was used, uh, would be used typically to, to provide farm uh, water in the area. So just to see what use that is in comparison to more advanced uh, wells. And in terms of just the background of what I'm really working on and what we've been working on on this in terms of what fingerprinting we're doing. So obviously a CO2 molecule looks like this pretty much. So carbon, a couple of oxygens uh, and methane, obviously again, uh, carbon uh, centered, but with the, the uh, hydrogen uh, bonds around it. And what we're interested in really is looking at the inherent both stable isotope fingerprints and then the other thing, the, the tracers is the noble gases, which are unreactive inert tracers that are associated both with uh, natural uh, methane that's in the, the subsurface and then with the CO2 that's being injected. And what we're trying to do here is two things really is understand the origin of the methane or any methane we encountered on the site, because we know from background uh, work in the area that there are high methane levels in some of the groundwater, so understanding where that came from. And then also looking at how we can use the fingerprints that are inherent within the CO2 to track uh, its migration and its fit in the subsurface. So moving on to, to some of the results, this is what we have got from the, the, the stable isotope plot against the uh, ratio. So on the y-axis here is the ratio of methane to heavier hydrocarbons. And across the bottom is the carbon isotope across the x-axis here is the carbon isotopic uh, fingerprint in uh, per mil. So this is the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13. Uh, and what we're just uh, putting up here is there's two diagnostic ranges. So up on the top left, we have the biogenic range, which is what you'd expect from methane that's produced uh, primarily from bacteria. And then down on the bottom right, we have the thermogenic range, which is methane produced by the the uh, maturation of uh, organic rich source rocks, so effectively hydrocarbon uh, thermogenic ge generated. And what we find is that almost all the samples show some are predominantly biogenic in origin. So there are shallow gas samples. There's plenty of bugs around, so that's not uh, unexpected. But we do see a sniff and we do see in, in a couple of other samples actually quite a high proportion of thermogenic methane in there that, that does suggest that there is a source of thermogenic methane in the area as well that uh, we wanted to investigate a bit further. Uh, and we plot up here again a, a fairly standard plot here on the y-axis. We've got the carbon isotopes and then plotted against the, the deuterium isotopes of the methane. We can actually get a bit more of an idea of the exact fingerprint and the exact generation mechanism of that methane and finding that most of that's coming from acetate uh, fermentation, uh, which is biogenically uh, derived. And with, um, again, a little bit of a fingerprint coming in of thermogenic methane. 
there is possible evidence of some CO2 reduction happening, although that trend off to the, the uh, right-hand side of that graph can also be explained by uh, methane oxidation. So uh, that can explain why we don't have a, a sort of confined clustered uh, things in that. But and you can see, particularly in that sample from the geophysics well, uh, that we're getting a strong signature of, of some thermogenic input in uh, some of the deeper uh, parts of the, the site. And this is just telling us we've got quite a mixed source of, of methane, again, predominantly biogenic, but with some thermogenic uh, inputs. Moving on to looking at the noble gases in the, the fluids that we have, this is the, the standard uh, uh, diagram of how the noble gas uh, system works, uh, particularly in this case, you can ignore the mantle component down in red. Uh, we don't have any of that, but what we do have is the differentiation between what comes in through the atmospheric recharge via uh, rainwater and into the groundwater, and then also what then accumulates over time from the radio radiogenic decay of uranium and thorium, and that being the radiogenic component which accumulates in time, over time in the, the deeper subsurface. And what we find uh, when we plot up all of the, the data that we've got, so again, talk through this plot. So on the y-axis, we've got the helium uh, three to uh, four ratio. And what we're looking at primarily here is just the increase in helium four relative to air. So you'll see air up at the, the top part, which is what we'd expect to see in a shallow ground or in direct contact doing uh, isotopic and uh, exchange within, within the atmosphere. Uh, and that's we would expect to have a comparable ratio to, to the air ratio of around about one, because uh, that's what we measure three, four ratios relative to. But what we find in, in all of the samples right the way across the, the site is actually the ratio we're measuring in these is considerably below the air ratio and down to, to more what we would expect to see uh, in an entirely crustal uh, source. And we see that increases, uh, that helium-4 uh, input increases as we go uh, across the site. And particularly early on when we were first sampling the site, we, we found that this was actually showing quite an excess of helium-4 relative to what we'd expect. And that's indicating that we've got a radiogenic input into the system. And we've got uh, that showing that we have got like, effectively some source deeper down in the subsurface providing helium into this, this system. So just to clarify that, we were also looking at the groundwater. So not only did we find that in the gas samples, so she said we, we sampled both gas, uh, free gas, and also water. We also found uh, helium excesses in mo the majority of the water samples that we got as well, even from the very shallow uh, depths, and particularly from the domestic water well. That was showing that, again, we have a, an external uh, helium-4 input into those samples. That's above what we would expect. And what we can then do, we can actually look at the uranium and thorium contents in the rocks that those are in and in the coal layers and find that even with those and given the geological age they've been buried for, how long they've been underground, uh, we actually find that, again, we can't explain the concentrations we're seeing without an additional uh, source of, of helium coming into the system. So these have to have been uh, an external source of, of this helium. Another thing to point out, which I'll just point out very briefly, is we do find quite a bit of variability for some of the same samples. This is something that um, I've been interested in looking at for, for a while, is that we quite often in these sites take uh, snapshot measurements. And this site's been really useful to go back a few times in different times to actually resample and see what the variation is. I think in these cases, what we're sampling from is not from the wells directly, which I've done in the past, but actually from things called the, the surface casing vents, which is effectively the side, the venting around the, the side of the well between the well and the rock. Uh, and that uh, shows that effectively connects up a whole uh, range of the, the rocks underneath. And some of those have got quite a bit of gas in them uh, and different sample protocols in terms of how long we've been shutting those uh, vents in for over time seems to produce a bit of a, a inconsistency in the, the data. Uh, and moving on the last part, just talking about the monitoring side of things, what we've also found is that the CO2 that's being injected in 
is enriched uh, in both krypton and xenon uh, relative to the amount of, of argon that we have in the sample. And you can see that here on this, this uh, simple graph, just showing that you've got that distinctive fingerprint. Um, we've been able to do some simple modeling on that, showing that that fingerprint of the injected CO2 relative to what we have in red, which is our best uh, sort of sample of, the, of where they're injecting that CO2, uh, will actually give us a pretty good uh, tracer of the injected CO2 up to, in terms of the xenon, you will be able to get that even at 0.1% contribution of gas from the injected CO2 uh, and detect that uh, very sensitively. Um, we can also do that in the overburden. So this is, uh, again, a bit more of a complicated plot. The simple thing to take from that, uh, there's a lot of mixing lines and things going on. But if you look at the zoomed in boxes, they're just showing the sensitivity. And again, particularly with the xenon, uh, we could actually see that uh, we would be able to pick up uh, even migration into a different part of the stratigraphy above using the xenon isotopes at uh, quite high sensitivity, so less than sort of 5% of the CO2. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because you've actually got a distinctive tracer there that's external to, to anything uh, related to, to the CO2 or the isotopes that doesn't get mixed with, with anything else. It's distinctive. It's not in the, the rest of the subsurface, and we can use that as a unique uh, fingerprint. So I'll just sum it up by saying the stable isotopes give us a, an indication of a biogenic source, but with evidence of uh, some contributions from, from thermogenic uh, methane source. We've got an excess of uh, helium in all of the samples, uh, and that can't be explained by in-situ generation. It has to be an external uh, contribution, which seems to be coming from depth. And we can maybe also attribute that to some sort of storage in the cold seams, because we, we know from previous work that helium can get trapped in, in cold seams. They seem to be quite good at retaining that. Uh, and we need to look at, or something that comes out of this, is that the, the sampling protocols, particularly when you're looking at these uh, things called surface casing vents, uh, could do with, they're not the best for, for getting these kind of samples, but um, we can work with them. But it would be good to, to have a consistent protocol for those. And that we found that the injected CO2 has got a unique fingerprint in terms of particularly the xenon relative to argon. And we can use that for, for tracking the CO2 both within where it's being injected and in the overburden uh, above for tracking that uh, migration. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Stu. Um, is this on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you can't hear it when you're saying it out loud. Um, I was interested by this kind of the sampling protocols and the inconsistencies or, you know, um, in the sampling. And if you were sampling from the overburden and you were, um, you know, you've, you've really clearly demonstrated that um, you can have confidence in the xenon, xenon <laughs> isotopes, um, yeah. how would the sampling kind of um, inconsistencies affect the confidence with which you feel like you could actually detect that migration? Yeah, so I'll explain a little bit more about what I was uh, referring to because I didn't have as much time as I would have liked. So in terms of, of what these are, these are vents, the valves that are usually open to vent the gases from beneath uh, the surface to the atmosphere. And as a kind of safety precaution, they leave those open typically. Uh, and what we were doing is we were going to the site the night before and shutting them in to allow a bit of a gas buildup. So we actually had something to sample the next day. And we weren't really doing that with any consistency in terms of shut-in times or also monitoring what the, the atmospheric pressure had been in the weeks sort of leading up to that. Uh, so that uh, was, that's the sort of side of things. So, you know, in the future, we, we recommend to do a consistent shut-in period. So it's the same shut-in period each time. And then also have a bit of a note of what's been happening atmospheric-wise as to whether you've had a lot of outgassing or whether you've had not so much outgassing. And actually something I'd like to do is put some sort of gas sensor on some of these just to see how the, these things do, do vary over time. Uh, in terms of the sensitivity of the, the, the tracers that we've got in, you know, the, the CO2 that's being injected is quite distinct and that could be contaminated by atmosphere. So basically what happens is if you have more uh, mixing with the atmosphere, uh, then you'll obviously see more of an atmospheric signature. But the idea being if you close that vent valve in for a longer period of time or got samples from uh, from a 
another place which is less interacting with the atmosphere, such as some of the well bores, you'd be able to pick up that xenon fingerprint um, more effectively. It's quite a long-winded answer, but hopefully. <laughs> okay, I won't keep you any longer, but I'd like to say thanks to Stuart, thanks to all the speakers, and thanks to, to all of you for coming. Thank you. Yeah.